Pat Anderson, welcome to 7.30. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Sorry, Sarah. It's very nice to have you. Now, uh, the Uluru Dialogues that produced the Uluru Statement from the Heart, it was a, a long process. There were 12 dialogues. You were present at all of them. And these notes that were being discussed in Parliament today, they're the notes of those, those dialogues. One commentator today described their contents as being hate-filled and divisive. Now, you were at those dialogues. What was the debate that you witnessed? Let me explain first of all. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is a one-pager. It's 439 words. Now, attached to that is pages called Our Story. And what is recorded there is our history according to our version of history. And yes, there was, as you do in these kinds of reports, we recorded everything that people said and that you have a true account. We were... We did this on purpose. That's what we were supposed to do, to record what people said. In another context as well, a lot of that people were distressed because we went out not long after um, Tony Abbott, when he was the Prime Minister, um, took about, and I'll stand corrected, I'm sure people have fact-checked it, check it, but about $500, 000, $500 million from Aboriginal programs and what have you. So a lot of the smaller wraparound services and others disappeared overnight. So people were angry, upset, distressed. In fact, we hadn't counted on this. And so the first few hours of every meeting was spent and we sat back and listened and heard what people said to us about what had happened to them and how um, that withdrawal of funds automatically, they didn't write and say, well, we're not going to fund you next year. They just disappeared. So that did cause a lot of um, anger and distress. So we recorded everything that people said. So that's what's in, and it's called Our Story. That didn't need people to accept that or vote on it. That's the responsibility of the Referendum Council, which I was co-chair, which you just said, with Mark Liebler. So we faithfully recorded what people said. And out of that whole dialogue process, um, the Uluru Statement... The words and the sentiments that are expressed there, somebody said it at some stage during that whole process. So, let I don't me, know let what me, to say. Let me ask you this. You, you also described it as the hardest work of your life. It's one of the most important yes. pieces of work. Why was it so hard to arrive at the Uluru Statement? It's difficult to get consensus. <laughs> uh, and with this level of distress, people were angry. Um, so, it was... That's why we let people say whatever they wanted to say, not that we were going to stop them in any way, but it was only after that process that we were able to settle down, if you like, to the program that we had, uh, we're taking out the five, uh, five terms of reference that we had, uh, we were in, um, entrusted to take out uh, to everybody. So I just want to make one point here to a lot of people don't understand this. Those, that was a... The terms of reference and going out as we did, that was a long process which began first with Julia Gillard a long time ago and um, it was um, Mr Turnbull and um, Bill Shorten who were in, they, it, was a, it was a bipartisan and after that whole process, I think we had like seven reports, you know, well, ten reports in about ten years or something. Yeah, so there was a whole series of yes. a time of revolving door prime ministers as well. So, yes. There was all this report, all this work that's been in the public arena for this, this latest iteration, 12 years. But of course, we've been doing this since 1788. Um, <laughs> yes, well, let the me, latest iteration. <laughs> let, me, let me come a little, a little bit to your story to understand this. So your, your own mother was a a, uh, a member of the Stolen Generations. You grew up yourself in a, in a camp outside Darwin. I want to know this. How personal is the voice referendum for you? I think it is for most um, First Nations people. Most, you know, we share, we, you know, the, the history of this country is bloody and it's bitter and it's full of pain and anger and distress. And we have been trying, we've done all the heavy lifting. We've been trying for a long time to get, I don't know, acknowledgement, recognition, or to be included in the political life of the nation and be part of it. So we've been totally excluded by all kinds of um, segregation, both political and social and so on. When I grew up in Darwin, which was in the in Prep Camp, and I'm very proud of all of those people 
were herded there. Um, we had lots of camps around Darwin, and they, as they were in every little town, every town in Australia, there were these communities. So we lived on the edge of town. Now, you, there was an old word that used, we used to be called fringe dwellers. But anyhow, so that's where I, I grew up in prep camp. Well, so, well let me, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, um, Pat, but I wanted to ask you something about that, because one of the arguments of the No campaign, and in fact, Warren Mundine made this argument on our program, that the opportunities for young Aboriginal people, for young Indigenous people, sorry, are so, are so much bigger now than they were for you in the 1960s. There's been so much in advancement. He makes that argument to say we don't need a voice because of the advancement that's taken place since then. How do you respond to that? Well, you know, that might be Mr Mundine's response, but the level of um, um, disengagement and um, disconnection and all of the problems that we have, the challenges rather, that we face, um, there's not a lot of difference in them. In some uh, some communities are worse off than others. That's, that's, there, there's a bit of difference there. But nevertheless, we are still excluded. And I don't know whether people, the public understand this, but every time there's a change of government, a change of prime minister, even a change of minister, we all have to troop to Canberra and explain why we need not even an increase, but to maintain that level of funding for our families and for our communities and the organisations that we run to service those communities. So, so every time there's... So we have to go... Sometimes we have to bring a map even to show the Prime Minister where we come from or the Minister. So everything goes back... The point of that story is that everything goes back to ground zero. So you got, you know, half a step or two steps forward and ten back every time there's so an election. In, in your view, and you've worked in health for decades, you have, as you call it, many, many years in the trenches, how would the voice change that situation that you just described? OK, taking on from that. So what happens if we had a voice? What would happen then? We would sit and wait until the election was held, and then we would go to the to the new governor and say, OK, this is where we got up to with the last mob, and this is where we need to go off from here on, so we won't be continually going backwards and forwards. We can actually move forward. But also, too, with a voice, resources can be better allocated and targeted to where they are most are most needed. And, you know, it's a, it's a universal truism that when you involve the people that you're making decisions for and policies for, when you engage them, you get better laws, better outcomes, and in our case, more targeted resources, and we won't have to go back to ground zero every time there's a change of government. So it'll make a huge difference to the relationship and how the country, in fact, operates. It would be better for everybody. You, and it'd be a, a much more equal kind of democracy. I, I mentioned before that you'd worked in health services for a very long time. You also co-authored the landmark uh, report into child abuse in the Northern Territory. Um, when you think about the experience that you've had in your working life, how different would it have been, do you think, if the voice had already existed? What practical difference, apart from continuity, would it have made? We would have been able to deal with that, um, the disadvantages in the housing is a huge issue. Um, uh, schools don't necessarily cater for our kids. We would have the wraparound services for those families that need them. So it would, we wouldn't have got to that stage, I don't think. I mean, this bad things happen. But we would be able to deal with things as, as they arise and not have to continually explain ourselves. We would have um, the mandate of the Australian people to sit down with the government of the day and the, and the bureaucracy of the day and talk through these issues and alert them to what's happening and we can head them off at the pass, so to speak, before they become issues. So, you know, this is not rocket science. This is... It's so simple. It's, I feel silly here even explaining it. This is... The, I, as I said, it's a universal truism and that's all that's on the table, really. And just briefly, the importance of having it enshrined in the Constitution because the opposition is offering a legislated voice... Why does it being in the Constitution matter so much to you? Every organisation that, that we've set up has been done away in an, in an afternoon, signed away, including uh, the, quite the powerful uh, ATSIC. ATSIC had its problems, but they were dealing with them. It was all done away in an afternoon. So there's no stability here, and we're at the whim of the current government of the day, so we have no... We cannot influence anything. They just wiped, wiped away in an, after, in an afternoon. So... So we can get some stability and some movement here to deal with the disadvantage and to prop so we can properly participate in the political life and social life of the of the nation. And so far we are fringe dwelling. Uh, 
varying degrees across the country, but nevertheless, we are the outsiders and we're knocking on the door as we have been for generations of us. And um, there is a really good, there is a, a good roadmap there on the table. Uh, it's simple, it's very clear, and uh, I think it uh, will, will move, move the country uh, forward. Pat Anderson, thank you very much indeed for coming on to 7.30. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.